Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about things in the Scriptures that have helped them become real to us, because we believe we need to draw more power out of the Scriptures, and we need all the help we can get. I'm your host, Kerry Mielstein, and I'm so happy to have with us again Dr. Jason Combs. He's a colleague of mine from Ancient Scripture. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, and it's it's wonderful to have you back. We had so much positive feedback from the the uh, episode you were with us before, uh, so we'll refer our audience back to that if you'd like to. If you didn't see that, or if you just want to remind yourselves, it uh, aired uh, July thirty first. Uh, it's testifying and enduring to the end. Jason Combs on Paul and the end of Acts. So we did uh, Acts twenty two through twenty eight, oh, and uh, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah. So we introduced we you then. Have this, we seem to have this habit of doing endings. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so now, that's right. now we're at the end of the New Testament. The end of the world, also. Yes. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, the the end of uh, the we're maybe at the restaurant at the end of the world. But anyway, that's a different uh, series. Uh, never mind that. But um, I, I, we introduced uh, Jason there, but maybe I'll just uh, introduce him uh, briefly here and let him tell us a little bit more about himself. So Jason. He, he did uh, his degree here at BYU in Near Eastern Studies, and then a master's in Biblical Studies from Yale and Classics at Columbia, and then his PhD uh, in really early Christianity and New Testament stuff from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, but he's with us now. We're fortunate to have him with us in the Ancient Scripture Department at BYU. Uh, what else did I? Well, and he's the author of a book that you may be interested in right now called Ancient Christians, because it kind of picks up where we're going to leave off, really, uh, after John, who's like the last apostle. Um, it, it picks up with uh, what happens with Christianity then. Yeah. So Ancient Christians, an yeah. introduction for Latter-day Saints. Yeah. I'm one of the editors. Uh, yeah. And I have a couple. I, I, I am an author as well. I've got a couple of chapters in here. Yep. But, and uh, all the other editors I, I know well, I know uh, Christian Heal and uh, Mark Ellison and Catherine Taylor, uh, they're, they're, uh, it's a great group to be involved with, and yeah. you've got a great bunch of scholars in that book. So uh, who publishes that? Is that the Religious it's Studies the, Center? The Maxwell Institute. Oh, that's the Maxwell Institute. Okay. Yeah. But you yeah. can probably find it on uh, Deseret Book and Certainly. the places like that. Yeah, any, anywhere books are sold. Uh, there you go. <laughs> or at least LDS books are sold, probably. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You may not find it at the Seventh Day Adventist the bookstore, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, wonderful. Uh, what else should we know about you? I know you have a wonderful family. I've I've met much of your family. We used to live fairly close to each other. Yeah, and and all of my kids are staying busy with with BYU, and and I've got one still in high school, and most of them are involved in theater. So uh, so you can you can see them if you're in Utah. You can see them around town at the at the Hale or the Sarah or or wherever wherever you watch plays. Uh, fun stuff. That's wonderful. Uh, well, good. Well, thank you, Jason. So uh, we also have a couple of messages we just want to uh, make sure our audience knows. First, I wanted to remind you that this is the last week you can get that 25% off at sequelbook.com on three of my books, God Will Prevail, uh, Finding Promised Blessings on the Covenant Path, and Learning to Love Isaiah. It's a great idea for a Christmas gift, and I think that uh, nothing will help you with the Book of Mormon as much as uh, learning uh, how Isaiah is used in there. So you might want to think about learning to love Isaiah or any of those. You get 25% off at SiegelBook.com if you just enter the code, car code carry at or carry 25 Let me say that again. You get 25% off at SiegelBook.com if you just enter the code carry 25 That's K-E-R-R-Y-25. Also, this episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Your Mental Wellness Coach. Let me tell you just a little bit about our family. We have a daughter who uh, did some uh, testing, and they learned that her body was making little to no serotonin, and you really need serotonin to feel happy. Uh, her, her doctor told her that she uh, must have a gene variant or... Um, that her body couldn't produce the enzymes that were necessary for that. And when we asked them what to do, and you know, this affects mood, energy, digestion, anxiety, sleep, all sorts of other things. When we asked him what to do, he said there really wasn't very much out there that could help, but he did know of one product that could help her to naturally produce. It just gave her body what it needed to produce serotonin. And we've seen it make a huge difference. In fact, uh, all of our daughters seem to struggle with this a little bit. I have a daughter I don't think would be on a mission if it wasn't for this product. Uh, it's something you can get that you can drink in fact, you can get kind of three. It's called uh, when you mix all three together, people call it happy juice. And right now, if uh, up through the 19th, you can get $10 off. If you will email your mental wellness coach at gmail.com, that's your mental wellness coach at gmail.com. Uh, you'll be able to get the code for getting uh, that $10 off. 
and she can refer you to other people who could uh, you could learn how to get tested and and so on. It can help all sorts of, especially youth and young single adults often, uh, and especially uh, young ladies, but many are struggling with making enough serotonin. Uh, we've seen it make difference with men and women, boys and girls. I'd, uh, it's, I've seen miracles. So I'd recommend if you have uh, anyone you know that might be struggling along these lines, uh, email your mental wellness coach at gmail.com. That's our sponsor for this week. And do it by the 19th to get that $10 off. All right. Well, with all that being said, Jason, we have a lot of material to cover today. I mean, this is kind of an insane amount uh, because not only because of how many chapters it is, I think we're at like eight or nine chapters, but also because uh, if you really want to understand these, you need uh, some detailed explanations. So we should do a five hour podcast. Uh, <laughs> Which is actually kind of funny. It turns out that last week, for whatever reason, one of the podcasts, when it uploaded, it, it said it was five hours long. It wasn't. It was an hour long, and it only took an hour to listen to. But so I don't know if people just skipped over that one. I was with Phil Allred, and it said it was five hours long. But this one is not going to be five hours long. Trust us. But if we we're going to cover everything, it would be. But instead, we're going to do what we can. So why don't you take us uh, where we should go here, Jason? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's worth pointing out that that the way that, that Come Follow Me is divided up um it's well i mean first of all i think it's worth pointing out that the book of revelation is a revelation sometimes yeah. we sometimes we add an s onto the end of it but it's actually a revelation yeah. and and because of that we should really read it in one sitting uh, it, it's meant to you're meant to get the whole picture all at once so dividing it up it's like a long this, sitting though yeah, it would be. Yeah. <laughs> Dividing it up like this is 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 a little unfair to to John, who wrote this down for us. Uh, and it and the way we've divided it up for Come Follow Me, it's sort of we we stop halfway through a story and pick up with that other half the next yeah. time. So yeah. like and I don't think there's any way to to avoid that, because, as you said, it's yeah. all one thing. And I think you actually can read it in about 90 minutes or so. But uh, yeah. it's it's all one thing. And so any place you choose to cut it is artificial. Right. That's right. Yeah. Um, at the same time, it it is a vision. And so images shift. And uh, John is definitely inviting us in to have this experience with him. He gives very vivid imagery of what's going on uh at at the end of of last time you looked at this chances are you're talking about god enthroned and you saw a lot of the same imagery you see at the beginning of the book of ezekiel um yeah. which uh it, it's really interesting actually i think how how often john uh describes things using the language of ezekiel or daniel i yeah. i often wonder if john in searching for language to describe this experience he had turned to scripture and started reading to say okay how how am i going to how am i going to share this with others how can i find the words to describe this amazing thing that i just experienced and so he often borrows language from ezekiel and daniel yeah, uh, I, I'm convinced, actually, that yeah. and it, it, I mean, he was raised knowing this stuff. So it, it kind of just naturally becomes part of how he expresses himself. But I think John draws on Old Testament language throughout the entire thing. If if okay. if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you're going to miss a lot in, in the book yeah. of Revelation. But I, I, you're 100 percent right that when he tries to describe God or uh, these uh, different apocalyptic elements, he definitely draws on Ezekiel and and for the apocalyptic stuff, especially Daniel. So I I suppose this is an invitation for uh, your listeners to go back and and listen to some of those episodes from last year. About yeah, very, good. Daniel. very good, very uh, good. In fact, I think really one day I've, I've out of this if you did that. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. You, there, there's no doubt. Uh, I, I've done lectures before where I compare the the different visions, like okay, Daniel, Ezekiel, John, and Nephi. And oh, yeah. um, I think, you know, uh, one day when I get done writing all the other things that I plan to write, then I think I'd like to write something on that one day. So we expect that in about 45 years. But yeah. anyway, yeah. it's it, it's it's wonderful, interesting stuff. Right. Good. Uh, so, um, yeah. So last time uh, you uh, John uh, invited us to join with him up in the heavens, witnessing the throne of God and angels surrounding that throne. And uh, then we saw that there was a scroll in in the hand of the one seated on the throne. And a question was asked, who who can open this scroll that's sealed with seven seals? 
And uh, John, um, John is sad uh, that nobody on earth or in heaven is able to open it. Yeah. But then somebody comforts him, a uh, name comforts him and says, it's okay, there is one who can open this. And we're told that it's the Lion of Judah. Yeah. Uh, and then when John turns to look to see this Lion of Judah, instead what he sees is a lamb as if slain. And I love that that shift of imagery. Uh, we think of this, this Lion of Judah, this conquering beast. And then when he looks, we realize that the way this beast conquered is by becoming a lamb who was slain. Which is one of the most powerful images of Christ, I think, in all of Scripture. And, I mean, Nephi will draw on it. All sorts of people will draw on, on that image. It's it's powerful. Yeah. And and we'll come back to it a couple of times. Um, it's it the, this imagery of conquering through Christ, through what to any good Roman citizen in the time would have seemed like defeat. Yeah. A, a, a weak lamb who's been slaughtered. And that is that is the conquering hero, yeah. In Revelation. So, so this lamb is in fact able to to open the seven seals, and then uh, in chapter four, uh, we we begin to. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter four is the the revelation of of God on the throne. Chapter five, we learn about the lamb. So, chapter six, we start to open these seals, right? And then one by one, every couple of verses. A seal is opened, and and we see we see something brief as the seal is open. Uh, for instance, verse uh, chapter six, verse one, the first seal is open, and uh, one of the four beasts says, "Come or come and see." And then uh, John looks, and what he sees is a white horse, and somebody sitting on him that has a bow, and a crown is given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And then we get the second seal open, come and see, and we get another image. And this repeats just every every other verse. We get a come and see all the way up till the sixth seal. And this is a pattern we'll see again and again in Revelation. It goes pretty quickly through the first five or six, or really through the first six events. And then it hits that sixth one, and suddenly things slow way down. Yeah. Or, or and, the seventh one, is it? Well, on the sixth, or is it, it on the sixth? It okay, slows down, and then okay. the seventh is usually even more slow. But okay. yeah, it's, it's those final, those final two where things slow way down, and then you finally get to the seventh, and you're like, okay, finally we're done, and then it starts with some new seven. Yeah, we get then after the seven seals, we get seven trumpets, and so things just every time you think, okay, we're here, we're finally at the end, we've made it through all this catastrophe, often. And finally, we're getting relief. And no, there's seven more of something, yeah. um, which is sometimes how it actually feels uh, in life, that, right? So, that's yeah. My life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's true. Uh, it's it's often when th things are going well, and then something goes a little bit wrong, and then something else, and then something else. It starts to seem to drag out, and usually yeah. it's at the point where you feel like I can't go on any farther. That you do have to go on a little bit farther, and then finally there is some relief. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, there's some great images for that that we'll get to. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, I think it's worth talking a little bit briefly about how to make sense of these seven seals that are open. Um, we do get some help from Joseph Smith. Uh, we get in uh, Doctrine and Covenant 77, that whole chapter is devoted to questions and answers about the book of Revelation. So, we get some insights there. Uh, regarding regarding these seven seals in Doctrine and Covenant 77, 6 through 7, uh, Joseph Smith there tells us that each of the seals represents a thousand years. Uh, so symbolically representing the entirety of the of human history, right? Um, Which, now uh, maybe I'll just comment on just yeah. uh, because I know some people get up in arms about that. I don't know that as members of the church that we're obliged to think that the earth is only 7,000 years yeah. old. I yeah. think uh, I think that we uh, we can understand that to be 
a, a period of time, a long period of time, right? So uh, when uh, Peter talks about, you know, seven days being like 7,000 years, a day being like a thousand years and a thousand years being like a day, it's almost like me saying to my kids, you know, I've told you a hundred times. (laughs) <laughs> when in fact i've probably told them 200 times but uh it, it's it's a number that we use to represent a long or a lot right and so uh, i i i agree that it's about the 7000 years when we think of that as a symbolic term right and it's nice of me to agree with joseph smith but yeah. uh i mean he's clearly correct he's the prophet but yeah. um but i think we should think of these as symbolic terms not necessarily literal numbers of days and hours and so on yeah, of course, uh, the, the the obvious problem for us right in, in the time that we live in is if we take this too literally, then we are currently in the millennium. Yeah, which it uh, doesn't really feel like the millennium. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, it is worth pointing that out. Um, it, it's also worth pointing out that, that this, what we get in Revelation 77 was not Joseph Smith's final word on how to interpret the book of Revelation. Right. Um, he also later on um, either changed his mind or perhaps added a, another way of interpreting it. Uh, because in um, I'm going to read you uh, the what Joseph Smith said as it's found in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith on page um, 290. Uh, but this is also found in two places in the uh, online Joseph Smith papers. Right. Uh, it's a discourse reported by William Clayton and then it's also in in just in um in the history um but yeah, here's so our, our audience could just search in the Joseph Smith papers and, and find certainly. this yes exactly uh so here's the quotation um Joseph Smith said now I make this declaration that those things which John saw in heaven um and that that includes what we're reading about right now these opening of the seven seals had no allusion to anything that had been on the earth previous to that time, because they were the representation of, quote, things which must shortly come to pass, close quote. He's quoting from Revelation right there, and not of what has already transpired. Um, There's a couple of places which talk about that in Revelation, the things which must shortly come to pass. But it's worth noting that one of them is right at the beginning of the section we're reading. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, when John is called up into heaven uh, to to witness all these things, it says at the end of uh, Revelation 4, 1, come up hither and and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So, um, so I think we need to be careful settling on just one interpretation and yes. saying that the only way to read these opening of the seven seals is as 1,000 years, uh, each part of 1,000 years of human history. Uh, and we should be open to the possibility that this all refers to things that were to happen in the future as well. Good. And, and that also opens up the notion that there's probably more than one way to interpret most of these things. And uh, I hear so many people who have just locked down, this is what it means. And I think, well, yeah. let's let's be a little more cautious. Yeah, I, I think one uh, one example of that is the way people have dealt with the, the four horsemen that yeah. appear at each of the first four seals. Um, Elder McConkie, for instance, in, in his uh, doctrinal New Testament commentary, suggested that each of those represented a specific figurehead of one of those dispensations. Like the first horse uh, is a horseman representing Enoch and so on. Uh, but but Elder McConkie was the first one to ever suggest that that's exactly what it means. No other Latter-day Saint prophet or apostle previous had suggested that. And so I, I think that's another place where we can be a little little more open to to multiple possibilities there. Right. And because I think again, if Joseph Smith is saying it's all in the future, then yes. that that doesn't right. work. But they can both work. That's the the beauty of Isaiah right. and John. I mean, yep. I, yep. more than anyone else, I think Isaiah, Isaiah and John great, great loves that. There. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it's also worth pointing out that uh, four horsemen, the the way the four horsemen is described. Uh, seems to parallel uh, four chariots uh, driven by four or pulled by four 
horses and, and driven by four horsemen uh, in Zechariah, right at the beginning of Zechariah yeah. chapter six, verses one through six, we get these four, uh, four chariots uh, that are being pulled by red horses and white horses and black horses and gray horses uh, that seem to, to parallel what's going on here in Revelation. And in, in Zechariah 6, 5, uh, so, so as Zechariah asks in 6, 4, uh, what, what are these? He asks the angel who's guiding him through this vision, what are these? And the angel answers in 6, 5 and says, these are the four winds uh, of heaven going out themselves before the Lord of all the earth, and so on. And so I think it's interesting that if you read those four horsemen in light of Zechariah, you start thinking about these four winds going forth. And then right when you get to Revelation 7, 1, what do we see? We see four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding four winds. Yeah. And so uh, again, John seems to be deeply embedded in the Old Testament and interacting with these prophecies past and, and seeing them in this new light, in light of the vision he's experienced, that he's sharing with these seven churches that are all present in, in his time. And and maybe there are a couple of things to, that are worth kind of unpacking there a, a little yeah. bit. Um, one, just this idea of four. I mean, as soon as you say four, then I automatically think, well, that, that's if we're talking symbolism, that's most often the four quarters of the earth, which is another that's... way of saying the whole earth. Which, by the right. way, seven is a way of saying everything, right? So right. what you end up with in John is a lot of numbers that are just different ways of saying everything, the whole enchilada, as yeah. it were. Um, <laughs> and and that kind of brings us to this notion that uh, Zechariah is another one. We didn't mention Zechariah, but Zechariah has a vision where he sees a lot of things, battles around the Jerusalem and the Holy Land and stuff. He, he, he sees a lot of this. And so... Uh, that that also brings up, and I should have said this when we talked about it earlier, but not only is John, I think, borrowing language from these Old Testament prophets, excuse me, mm-hmm. <clears throat> ah, sorry, not only is John borrowing language from these Old Testament prophets, but in many ways, they're seeing the same thing. And so they're, they're going to, uh, and it may be with different symbols, or the, uh, they experience it slightly differently or something, but God is showing them in a lot of cases, very similar things. And so that's another reason why we're going to see a lot of similarities. So they borrow each other's language, but they're also having similar experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think um, I'm glad you brought up the the thing about the numbers. This is probably a good time to to pause and and think a little bit about how many times we see different numbers coming up in the book of Revelation and how often those numbers are symbolic. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned already the number four. Uh, absolutely, right here, beginning of chapter seven, verse one. These four winds, four uh, four angels over the earth. I mean, definitely, that's calling to mind the idea of four corners of the earth. Yeah. And so the idea is that the angels are covering the totality of the earth. Right. Um, I think you mentioned the number seven as yeah. well. Uh, right. So seven, seven days of the week, uh, seven uh, period or six days, God created the world on the seventh. He rested. So yeah. seven always represents, as you said, this idea of totality, of of completion, of wholeness, perfection. Right. Yeah. And uh, and that number is probably used in John more than any other number. Oh, so yeah. Seven is just like you're, you're tired of it by the time you're done with this book. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. We're in the middle of the seven seals right now. Then we go yeah. on this. After the seven churches with the seven crowns and the seven, yeah. everything else, seven stars and so on and so on. Yeah. 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 Um, which, which I think in part calls to mind, especially things like the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls calls to mind in a way, God's creative work. But here it seems to be the undoing of God's creative work leading up to at the end of revelation, a new creation, yes, a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. So, um, so yeah, and I, th- I think that's also carried in this idea we see so often, like the earth will be wrapped together as a scroll or something like yeah, that. But yeah. which, by the way, is what you do when you're done with the scroll, yeah. right? You you wrap it together. I I think it that's just a way of saying. I don't know that it means that the earth like disintegrates and we turn into a black hole or something like that. But uh, okay. I I think it's a way of saying what we're done with this phase of the earth, yeah. and we are reborn in a different phase, that yeah. celestial phase phase. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll have a millennial phase and then a celestial phase. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so number seven, we talked about it. Number four, we talked about it. Uh, number 12 is another yeah. one that comes up a lot, right? As, as we're and, getting and it's into multiplication seven. 
Yeah, yeah. and multiplications of 12. Yeah. So 12, 24, 24 around the throne, 24 yeah. uh, angels uh, yeah. in, in chapter... And 144,000. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. in chapter 7, we get uh, 12,000 called out of each of the 12 tribes, which equals right. 144,000. Yeah. So that becomes a really important number as, as those that... As, and again, as you said, symbolic. I don't think yeah. we, we should believe that God is limiting his salvific power to only what exactly 144,000 <laughs> yeah, and yeah, 144,000 and one, that one's going to have to be excluded because we yeah. got to get the right number too, too um, bad for you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You're the last one and you're, you're left out. Um, and, so, and 12 is typically symbolic of, of, <clears throat> uh, governance and and uh, the house yeah. of Israel and covenant, right? So governance yeah. within a covenant and covenant people yes. and that kind of a yes. thing. Yeah. So definitely um, these 144,000 are God's covenant people. Yeah. Uh, symbolized by, by Israel, right? Yeah. It's God's covenant people, Israel, and all those invited to join with Israel. Yes. Uh, another, another number that oftentimes I think we often overlook as being symbolic well, actually, I think there are several numbers that sound that sometimes sound too too precise to be symbolic. Uh, like we get um, uh, in in Revelation chapter eleven, verse two, we get forty and two months. Um, we get in Revelation eleven three, we get a thousand two hundred and three score days. Uh, and we get that also in Revelation 12, 6, 1,203 scored days. We get these really precise numbers, yeah. uh, three and a half years, 42 months, 1,000, uh, or, or 1,260 days. And if we read over it too quickly, we don't realize those are all actually the exact same number. Uh huh. I did not realize that three and a half years is 42 months and is 100 or 1,260 days. <laughs> so, so that's Paul, funny. So John, John is also in this, in his experience and in, in relaying that experience to us playing around with this number three and a half, three and a half years, which is 42 months, which is 1,260 days. Sometimes it's not three and a half years. Sometimes it's three and a half days. Uh, sometimes that's written as a time times and half a time or a yeah. time, two times and half a time. But all of those are three and a half. And I think three and a half is significant because it's exactly half of seven. Right. And if seven is a complete week is completion, wholeness and perfect, then three and a half is right in the thick of things. Yep. Right. Yep. At the, 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 it's, it's in the middle of a Wednesday. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a time when it seems like the week is never going to end, right? And and you'll notice when those times come up, it's always in the middle of a time of trial. Yeah. At the end is doesn't feel like it's near. It it feels like it's at the middle of a time of struggle. So all of those numbers, three and a half years, forty two months, one thousand two hundred sixty days, as well as three and a half days, as well as a time times and half a time, all of those symbolize a time of trouble. A time of trial. That's really good, really, really good. And I, I'm I'm grateful. I didn't realize I had, I'd never taken the numbers like you could sat down and, and worked with them. So that's yeah. that's fantastic yeah. to know. Maybe I'll also just issue a caution on numbers. I don't think I've seen, uh, or on on time periods. Uh, mm -hmm. I I don't think I've seen anywhere where people have gone uh, as hog wild as they do with these time periods and trying to figure out like, okay, this many days since Christ was born and then this happened. Nice. And, and usually they're on the wrong time period for when Christ was born anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and all sorts of stuff. And I think we're, we're just getting like way too literal with this yeah. stuff that is meant to oh, be yeah. symbolic, but I've, I've seen like, hours long YouTube videos that people are just asking me about like crazy that are all based on taking all these numbers like to the day and to the hour. And I just think, yeah. I don't think that is yeah. what John was intending for us to do. That's right. Yeah. I, I, uh, during graduate school, I lived for a time in the Bible built yeah. and, uh, and it was, it was sort of surprising to me at times to be driving down the freeway and see a big billboard announcing the precise date that Jesus would come back and giving, <laughs> oh, you a website, giving you a website you could go to, to see how that calculation was reached. Yeah. And it was often yeah. based on 
taking these number of years and these days as if they were literal rather than symbolic. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, that's and, great. And, and <laughs> Maybe just, we should do a billboard like that just for fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, ju- and just to caution your your listeners, uh, the dates that those billboards had announced have all passed now. So oh, darn. you can, you can, you can, uh, you don't have to worry. Okay. Uh, the and the Mayan is, calendar ended too, darn it. Yep, yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, every, every so many years, we have a new announcement about the precise day that the world will end. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't come from uh, our, our prophets and apostles. It comes from no. random people on the internet <laughs> announcing that they figured it out. They've calculated yeah. the precise time. Yeah. In, in fact, and I don't want to go too long on this, but just because President Ballard passed away not that long ago, it reminds me of... Uh, uh, devotionally gave at BYU where he said, I don't know when Christ will come again. And as far as I know, none of my brethren in the Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency knows. And I would humbly suggest that if we don't know, nobody knows. And, and, and yeah. I think, okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. 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 So I'll, maybe, I'll not, maybe I'll not we... take the billboard more seriously than the prophet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's probably good advice, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So let's... Uh, Let's move on maybe and talk a little about, uh, say something briefly about the seven trumpets. Okay. Then, and then we can go on and talk about some of the, the visions that happen in revelation 12 after that. All right. Uh, so revelations eight through 11, uh, we, we have just opened the seventh seal in, in revelation seven, and then suddenly we're not done. We then get seven trumpets. And each right. of those trumpets leads to something else, leads to leads to really catastrophes happening on the earth. We get a uh, hail, fire, and blood, a sea as blood, uh, bitter water, darkness, locusts, an angel of death. And if you if you listen closely to this podcast last year, a lot of those probably sound very familiar. Yeah, <laughs> yep. because those those are all found at the beginning of Exodus, right? Yeah. It's, these are these are the plagues that uh, that Moses uh, pronounces uh, to Pharaoh if Pharaoh does not let his people go. So um, so it's interesting to see a lot of those plagues returning and the and this this prophecy uh, that those that those this undoing of creation will precede new creation as we've already right. talked about. And and uh, in fact, if my audience were to go back and listen to me talking about the uh, the plagues, they would hear me talking about how it, this looking from an Egyptian point of view about the uh, the chaos triumphing or the undoing of creation, and that there has to be a new creation, and that uh, you've got the yeah. symbolism of that in the Red Sea and so on. But I think it is all tied to that same idea. We've got to, we're going to undo this and have a a, a rebirth, right? Yeah. So. yeah. And and we see with these seven trumpets the exact same pattern we saw with the seven seals. It moves very quickly through the first five uh, plagues that happen, and then it hits that number six, and it slows down. Mm. So number six, so so uh, the the first trumpet is just Revelation eight seven. The second is eight eight through nine. The third is verses ten and eleven. So you can see how quickly it's moving. Then you get to the third to to the the angel of death, the sixth plague in this list, and that's Revelation 9, 13 through 21. <laughs> so it slows way down. And then it you're still not to the seventh. You get this massive interlude that takes up all of chapter uh chapter 10 and into chapter 11 with the uh with the measuring of the temple. Yeah. And Which so will be a theme we see come up later as well, and has yeah. echoes in oh, Ezekiel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we don't we don't finally get to the the seventh trumpet until Revelation chapter eleven, verses fifteen through through nineteen. Um, and that means sure oh the, oh go ahead no 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 go ahead go ahead. I was just going to say something about the measuring of the temple. Oh, all right. Be- before we do that, maybe th- there is one thing that I, I in chapter nine that I kind of wanted to. Uh, talk about it and see you tell me yeah. if i'm crazy or if i'm wrong or something but uh, as we get at the beginning of chapter nine and you've got the uh, fifth angel sounding the trumpet in the midst of of this sill right um and uh it, it's interesting you get in chapter nine verse um three that you've got these these locusts that are these crazy locusts like scorpions and stuff anyway yeah, yeah. Uh, give, they, they are given power as scorpions to have uh, uh, scorpions of the earth to have power 
verse four is really interesting to me. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Mm. So that goes back to the 144,000. Yeah, so I would say yeah. only those who are not making and keeping covenants, we could yeah. kind of say, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but then verse five, and to them, it was given that they should not kill them. So I think this is saying to, uh, uh, they can't kill and I, I think this means spiritually kill. We're all going to die, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Um, but can spiritually kill the people who have the seal of God in their foreheads, um, but that they should be tormented five months. Right? Again, symbolic number. I don't think it's actually five yeah. months. And uh, their that, torment. Five, five months uh, actually happens to be the lifespan of a locust. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're just handy to have around, Jason. Um and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strike with man, which is not fun, right? Um, and 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 so this seems to me to be saying that a covenant keepers can't expect to avoid all of the pain that is part of the times of turmoil. Yeah. But it is different for them. They are going to go through pain. Like stor scorpions yeah. things, I haven't been stung by a scorpion, I'll say. I'm glad. But I, I hear it's not fun. Um, yeah. But but they're not going to die. God is going to take care of these covenant people. They don't escape everything. And if we were to look at this from a larger perspective, I mean, that pain and the struggle is part of our mortal probation that helps us become God like it's a refiner's fire. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that's important to recognize. Covenant people are protected, but it doesn't mean they're pain free. Yes. And and I think uh, with that, this, this is a bit of a teaser for uh, the next, uh, whoever's covering the next part of Revelation. Oh, that's uh, Nick. Oh, okay. Nice. Uh, so at the end of Revelation, of course, uh, you get this new Jerusalem. Yeah. But if you read that section very carefully, you find out that the inhabitants of this new Jerusalem, where they lived before, was a place called Babylon. Yeah. It's described as the whore of all the earth and all these bad things happening there. So, yes, uh, as 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 followers of the Lamb, uh, we are not able to totally protect ourselves from from the trials and from the challenges of living in this world and and yeah we we will not go totally unscathed uh but and if, there in are, fact we don't want to made. yes yeah yeah there are promises but i mean we would not be becoming more christ-like if we avoided all yeah. trial and and yeah. pain right uh, yeah. but you're right th th those promises are the important part which i know we're, we'll keep focusing on yeah Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks for humoring yeah. me on that. No, but I, no, I, I wanted to see really if you good. agreed with that. And yeah, uh, it absolutely. seems apropos for living in times of turmoil. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, when we come to the end, it's worth circling back around and thinking about what the, what the overarching message of revelation is, because yeah. it's so easy to get bogged down in, in all the turmoil, which is clearly a big part of Revelation is is revealing the challenges that that the followers of the Lamb face, uh, but there are promises made, and and I think it's worth coming back to those promises at the end today. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that the turmoil is designed to highlight what the real emphasis is. So yes. we'll we'll come yeah. back to that. Yeah, I like that. Good. Uh, so yeah, so we get these these two witnesses uh, that are mm. that are symbolically represented as olive trees and candlesticks, and they are called to to measure this temple, and then they're called to uh, to be witnesses. And this is another one that we actually have some information in in Doctrine and Covenant seventy seven about. Uh, in Doctrine and Covenant seventy seven fifteen, uh, we're told that these are. These are two prophets that will rise up among the Jewish nations. These are two Jewish prophets. Um, but this is another place where I think we can get some more insight into these two figures by looking at passages in the Old Testament as well, uh, because this is another passage that seems to refer uh, or have parallels with Zechariah. Uh, in Zechariah, Be Before we leave uh, Revelation, if it's all right, Jason, I keep interrupting yeah. you, but I, I just want right. to learn from you. So... Uh, I'm curious your take. So in, in 77, 15, yeah. it says they are two prophets that are raised up to, uh, sorry, to be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days at yeah. the time of the restoration and to yeah. prophesy to the Jews. So yeah. I have always wondered uh, exactly what you were saying. The, are these then Jewish prophets or are these prophets raised prophets. up to the jews and yeah, yeah. I, I don't know how to, to I, yeah. I just don't know how to tell uh, and maybe it, there is no way to tell yeah. um 
I, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I think that's one of those situations where prophecies are always uh, clear in sight. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I think, think actually intended to be so. Some of these yeah, prophecies that says yeah, yeah. they'll recognize them when they come to pass. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, I, I should be hesitant to say Jewish prophets because I think you're right. I think it it's not 100 percent clear in DNC 7715 whether they are whether they are Jewish prophets or whether they are prophets who are not Jewish who are raised up to address the Jewish people. Yeah. I think it could go either way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I start to be curious, like what what is meant by Jewish people? A couple of things to be meant, but we won't get detailed on that. <laughs> that's but right. anyway, yeah, that's right. Um, so I, what I want to point out is uh, there are some great Old Testament connections here too. Uh, Zechariah three and four also has a vision about two lampstands, two olive trees uh, that are uh, that have something to do with the temple. And these seem to specifically refer to Old Testament figures who we know historically, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, who were involved mm -hmm. in rebuilding uh, the temple after they were ex after the Jews were exiled to Babylon. Then we get Cyrus the Great, who allows them to return. The Jews return, and then they start rebuilding the the temple that Babylon had destroyed. Yeah. And, and so, in fact, much of Zechariah's purpose is to support them in their mission because their the, things are floundering. They're not getting the temple built the way they yeah. can. And Zechariah comes along with these visions and people rally behind Zerubbabel and Joshua and and get the temple built. Yeah. So so reading reading Revelation in that light, again, uh, making these Old Testament connections suggests that uh, this is this is a hopeful time. This is a time perhaps of return from exile. So a time of gathering. Uh, so a lot of the themes that that we think about as necessary leading up to the second coming of Christ, themes of gathering, themes of temple building, yep. we find right here, both in Revelation and in this connection to Zechariah. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, especially this, you know, temple covenant gathering emphasis is, yeah. is good stuff. Yeah, it and, feels like and, we're in the middle of that, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also worth pointing out that that uh, that scholars who uh, non non Latter Day Saint scholars who study the Book of Revelation have made that connection with with uh, Zechariah and so with temple building and all of that. Uh, they've also considered that perhaps these two witnesses are meant to represent Moses and Elijah, hmm. uh, which again, as Latter Day Saints, also we have a strong connection with Moses and Elijah and. Of course, they appeared to Joseph Smith in the Kirtland Temple to restore keys necessary for gathering and necessary for temple work. Uh, and so lots of interesting possible connections between this passage in Revelation, this future measuring or this measuring of the temple and this these future prophets and and the work that we are called to do as Latter-day Saints. And probably all of the above is the right answer, right? All, all, yeah. all of these things are intended and, and brought together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and so, with that, we then get at the end of chapter eleven. Uh, it's it's finished. The final trumpet is blown, and so the book of Revelation is done. Except it's not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're only we're only halfway through the book of Revelation, but it kind of feels like it should be done after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But but then then it sort of starts all over with Revelation twelve, and we get this new vision. Uh, and this is this is one of the only visions, if not the only vision, in the book of Revelation that isn't clearly numbered. Uh, we mm -hmm. had the seven seals where we, we were clearly able to follow the order there, then seven trumpets. After this, we're going to get seven bowls. But right in between, we get these unnumbered visions uh, that are a little more complicated. Yeah, and, and we're introduced to some new symbolic figures that that aren't always perfectly clear who they are and may have more than one meaning behind them. Yep. So Although, uh, interestingly, I think this yeah. is the section that has the most parallels. Well, one of the sections has the most parallels with Nephi's vision. Mm. Um, so uh, that, that's interesting. And Nephi doesn't have all these numbers in there anyway. Yeah. I don't, I'm not sure what to make of that, but I'm going to have to give that yeah. some, some thought. Yeah. 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 It's, it's worth reading these in parallel and thinking about, what what Nephi might be seeing and how he's understanding it versus what John saw, uh, which may be the same thing, but John yeah. may understand it in a slightly different way. 
Yeah. Uh, and I and I think we can see that in Revelation 12 because a lot of these images that that Nephi takes in in one very specific way, John seems to leave a little more open. Um, yeah. So yeah. so well, ne- Revelation- Nephi tends to zero in on one thing that has to do like uh, with his people or something. I mean, that's yeah. kind of a tendency. But yeah. I might just remind our audience that uh, last week, Andy Skinner, uh, Dr. Andrew Skinner, talked about these two visions. But he said you, you get a different emphasis, like. John emphasizes the second coming, whereas Christ seems to emphasize the first coming, although they both talk about both, right? So yeah, yeah. that's that's an interesting element as well. But. Yeah, nice. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so Revelation 12, we, we are introduced to these new symbols, uh, a woman, a child who's born of the woman, and a dragon. Mm. And then in Revelation 13, we get two more uh, key figures, uh, two beasts. Yeah. Uh, so... In Revelation 12, there's really only one of these figures that John tells us exactly what it is. And that's that's the dragon. Right. In Revelation 12, uh, verse 9, we're told specifically that this dragon is the devil or Satan. Yeah. And so so that that helps. That does provide us a little bit of a key to understanding what's going on here. So at least we know what one of these symbols absolutely 100 percent definitely is. The dragon is Satan. And we, and we also have mentioned in connection with him, Michael, who we equate with Adam, right? So yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that those those two, we kind of get a bit. So Right, right. Um, then we have the child. And the child is a little more complicated. Um, but there's one detail about the child that I think helps us to pin it down a little bit more because of something John will say later in the book of Revelation. And that is in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, uh, the woman brings forth a man-child uh, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And then we and then it explains that her child is caught up unto God and to his throne. Mm-hmm. Now, with that detail, if we compare that later with Revelation chapter 19, verse 15 and 16, here's what we hear. In Revelation 19, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. There's the connection. So it seems like whoever this child is, is also the same one who is going to, who rules with a rod of iron. That's how he's defined in 12.5 and again in, in 1915. And then 16, or 1916 tells us precisely who this is because it says, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So it okay. seems like we can read this child. I'm being really careful because John doesn't yeah. say it directly, but it seems like we can read this child as Jesus. Right. And I think that also ties up with, I mean, that's the one who is, when you go, you see God on the throne also in the midst of the throne. He's the only one that's kind of, God yeah. is on his throne. He's not displacing God from his throne, but he's in the midst and he's there with him. It's Christ, right? Yeah. So you have these couple yeah. of triangulation clues, we could call them yeah. uh, about this. Uh, yeah, but that that gives us questions about the woman because, I mean, you would that's assume right. in some ways, Mary, but in some ways it just, it, it's more than that. So I'll let you, I don't want to yeah. take no, away from what you were going to say. That's Go where ahead. I'm going next. So right. yeah, so. So it seems obvious then, right? So the woman who gives birth to Jesus must be Mary. But then when we read more about this woman, it's it's less clear that it is definitely Mary. I think it yeah. is. I think we can read this woman as Mary. Yeah. But I think well, I'd say woman, it's one of the interpretations. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the woman is more represents more than just Mary. Um it, it, in particular, just from the beginning of introducing her, 12:1 introduces her as uh, there's a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, with uh, uh, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Well, 12, we've seen that number previously associated yeah. with Israel. So yeah. perhaps this woman is symbolically Israel, who also, symbol- who also, more than symbolically, gives birth to the Messiah, yeah. right? Jesus is from Israel. And yeah. so maybe this woman's Israel. But we read a little bit more, and uh, then the woman is being chased by the dragon. And in 12.6, the woman flees into the wilderness where God protects her there. And there we get one of those hundred 
uh, or 1,200 three score days. So in the midst of, in the thick of things, this is, this is a time of trial that she's, that she's hidden away. Uh, we get the dragon then. Um, this is, this is where I think it starts to suggest the, the woman may be more than just Mary or just Israel. Uh, because in 1217, the dragon is wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. So now it seems like the woman is the church. Yeah. And that the dragon is persecuting the saints. So this, this woman seems to be a multifaceted image here that is Mary, that is Israel, that is the church. And, and from our point of view, uh, Israel and the church are not as separate things as uh, it would be for most of Christianity, yes. right? Yeah, so that's right. Uh, the, it, and maybe there's a time where, I mean, before the restoration, where uh, Israel, the church has become kind of Israel, and there may not be that many actual descendants of Israel, but there probably are a lot, and you know that kind of a thing. But yeah. uh, but it's still the idea. It's it's chosen people, people who are following God and and making covenants, even though for a period of time that's without priesthood authority. But I think still people who are committed to God and and making yeah. vows to yeah. Him and so on, uh, and and so that's not so separable for us. They they they're complementary ideas i would say israel yeah. and the church to us are complementary and so that works really well yeah uh, i'd also say that uh and i know many members of our church uh, struggle with understanding how this could happen but but this chapter can help us understand some of the reverence that's given to mother mary right or madonna yes. or whatever oh, you like to call her when yeah. when you equate this with mary and yeah. she's uh, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown yeah. of 12 stars uh, and if you're not inclined to think of Israel as much of Christianity wasn't for a, a long time, they, they kind of felt like that whole idea was over, uh, yeah. then the emphasis gets put on Mary. And uh, I, I I get how we get to where she's the figure she's become. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying that. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Mary's a big fan of uh, some of the things that happen in her name. But, uh, but so I'm not saying we should all start praying to Mary or something. But right. Right. Um, but I understand how it got there. Yeah. And certainly, um, as Latter-day Saints, we we have unique witnesses of Mary in the Book yeah. of Mormon yes. uh, that, that are not found in any other scripture that definitely exalts her in a way. Right. Yep. It, 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 up, it, it, uh, it, it praises her for being somebody specifically chosen by God to be the mother of, of the Savior. Yep. So, and so, and more than anywhere else, that is, I mean, it's other places, but more than anywhere else, that's a Nephi's vision, yeah, which yeah. is paralleling this vision. So That's right. That's right. Good. Uh, so, um, yeah, so let's let's now talk about what this what this dragon gets up to. Uh, <laughs> so, so this dragon is uh, we, we've just learned that this dragon is out to get the saints. It's out to get the, the members of the church who have a testimony of Jesus. And then in chapter 13, suddenly the dragon just disappears for a minute. And we're introduced to this other figure, this beast, uh, who uh, who rises up out of the sea. And this is, as, as many of the images are in Revelation, this is a strange looking beast with seven heads and ten horns and upon the, his horns, ten crowns. And this, this may have parallels to some of the imagery we see in the book of Daniel as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, definitely. And uh, it's not until verse 4 that we encounter the dragon again, but, and where we learn that actually this, this beast has received its authority, its power from the dragon. And that, and that because of what this beast is doing, it is encouraging people to worship the dragon. And so I, I think it's interesting that right after telling us that this dragon, who is Satan, is out to persecute the saints, that suddenly the image of the dragon disappears. And yeah. instead we get the beast. And it's only subtly that we learn that actually it's the beast that's doing the work of the dragon, Satan, and that people are starting to worship the beast because of what, or worship the dragon, worship Satan because of what the beast is doing. 
I think Which that, is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's I think there's some insights into into the double strategy there, right? Yeah. I, I would I can't agree more. In fact, I find myself frequently as I go through scripture classes, you're just always talking about this tension between the world and and the kingdom of God or, or godly things yeah. and worldly things. And yeah. I keep talking about the world and worldly things. But every now and then you have to stop and say, well, I mean, in the end, who's behind worldly things? Yeah. I, I mean, there is someone behind this, right? And I I don't want to say that people who are pushing like wealth is the most important thing, that they are overtly worshiping Satan. Yeah. But he's the one who's if, if you peel the onion layers back far enough, that's who's standing behind that idea, right? Um and and while we're on this and the and the beast, maybe I'll just uh I'd like to read um just a couple things from Joseph Smith that I think are helpful. Yeah, um, that'd be great. First of all, he says, when prophets speak of seeing beasts in their visions, they saw the images, types re represent certain things. And at the same time, they received the interpretation as to what those images or types were designed to re represent. I make this broad declaration that wherever or where God ever gives a vision of an image or a beast or figure of any kind, he always holds himself responsible to give a re revelation or interpretation of the meaning thereof. Otherwise, we are not responsible or accountable for uh, for a belief in it, but I think he means understanding of it. So, And then he says, don't be afraid of being damned for not knowing the meaning of a vision or a, vision or a figure where God has not given a revelation or interpretation on the subject. So I think we can understand certain things here, and there are some things that we're not going to fully get, and that's okay. Yeah. And he also said, uh, when God made use of the figure of a beast and the visions of the prophets, he did it to represent those kingdoms which had degenerated and become corrupt, savage, and beast-like. And so I, I think we can. We do get that that much interpretation that there is something here about kingdoms. Worldliness is maybe a good you know, world kingdoms, yeah. the pursuits yeah. of power and popularity and pleasures yeah. of flesh and so on. Um, but uh, so I think I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that broad interpretation. And on rare occasion, I, you know, in Daniel stuff, sometimes you can say, yeah, this does seem to represent Babylon or something like, well, Daniel yeah. in one case says it represents Babylon. Yeah. But right. um, but I don't know that we need to get into like so much specific stuff unless God gives us just that specific stuff. The more general is is safer in, until we have revealed to us some specifics. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I think I think there are some really clear ways in which people in John's time, the the maybe those who belong to these seven churches in Asia Minor who read this, could have seen some very direct connections to things happening in their own time yeah. that they would have said, "Oh yeah, this I I get what John's talking about." Yeah. And I think and, and that's likewise valid likewise today. I think yeah, likewise yeah. we can see things in here and go, "Oh yeah, that's." I can see that kind of worldliness creeping into my own life in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and our culture, like I mean, increasingly saturated in our culture. And I yeah. think those are valid interpretations. I, I just get uh, hesitant when I hear someone say, "This is this, and it's only yeah. this," and I'm like, "Well, I don't yeah. know how we know that." But anyway, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I think uh, let's let's talk about one of those examples of people who say this is this. Okay. Uh, I think I think one of the most common things in this chapter that uh, people love to say, "I have the absolute solution," is when it gives the name of the beast, uh, but it doesn't actually give us the name. It gives us what it says is the number of the beast's name. Um, and so I think it's worth pointing out that that. Um, that Jews and and non-Jews in this time like to play around with numbers because yeah. back then uh, their number system was the same as their alphabet. In in English today, of course, we have different different systems for our alphabet, and then we we have our our Arabic numeral system right. uh, that uh, that we use. But but in this time. Hebrew letters were also numbers, and Greek letters were also numbers. And that means that you could look at a name and read the name, but you could also add up the letters of the name to get a number. Yeah. And so that that's definitely what John is doing here. He's definitely, by saying the number of the name is 600, three score, and six, he's definitely saying you can add up this name to get that. But he never actually tells us what that name is. Mm -hmm. And so um, so there are ways to try and read that in its ancient historical context. Some people have suggested maybe this is Nero because you can add up the name uh, Caesar Nero and get 366. 
And there are different aspects of how this beast is described that seem to reflect some things that we know about Nero. There was definitely Nero made a massive statue uh, in his uh, in his in his own honor uh, uh, called the Colossus of Nero. Um, that later Hadrian ended up moving next to the Colosseum, which is why that amphitheater became called the Colosseum because it was next to the Colossus Plus of Nero. Uh... Um, so, so there is definitely a massive statue statue of Nero. There was definitely emperor worship going on in the time. So yeah. the idea that people were worshiping the image of the beast. That seems to fit. Uh, the idea, um, there were rumors circulating that after Nero died, there were some people who were claiming to be Nero in the East um, as a way of trying to get authority for themselves. And so rumors start circulating that Nero, who we thought had died, had come back. And we, as we saw, or as we can see here, uh, this beast in uh, Revelation 13, 3, uh, one of the heads is wounded to death. Uh, but the dead, the deadly wound is healed, and the world wonders after the beast. So some of saw, saw connection there. So so it's possible it's possible that this could be Nero. Um, it would make sense in that certainly Nero was absolutely a persecutor of Christians. So it would be understandable to see Nero as this kind of figure. Uh, but Nero is certainly not the only one who who fits this. Um, some have suggested maybe the Emperor Domitian, uh, because the Emperor Domitian printed a coin, and on that coin were certain letters that were an abbreviation for his his name that could be added up to 666. Um, there are other manuscripts of the Book of Revelation that don't have 666 as the number, but have 616 as the number. Uh, I think there's also one that has a slightly different number. Um, so so all that is to say, we do need to be really careful with saying we definitely know who this is. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly we need to be careful with saying that today, because you can hop on the Internet and Google who is 666 and find all sorts of politicians associated with that number, yep. all sorts of uh, rumors about Pe uh, people getting imprinted with barcodes that will have that. I mean, there are all sorts of wacky things that you can find online today uh, where people have figured out what the definite answer for this is. Yeah. Uh, so, so we need to, we need to be a little cautious going there. I agree. Yeah. Um, I think it, I think it is worth uh, pointing out though, that, that in the context of the book of revelation written at the beginning to these seven churches in Asia minor, um, there, there is definitely, there is definitely language in the book of revelation that is helping them to see the challenges they are facing living in Rome. Yeah. Uh, and there's definitely, uh, when we get later, uh, this is beyond what we're covering today, but later talking about this, this Babylon, the great, this horror of the earth. Um, at one point it describes her as seated upon seven mountains um, and that that is probably the most obvious connection to Rome yeah. in the entire book of Revelation, because Rome is known as the city of the seven hills. Yeah, uh, there's actually a coin uh, minted by Vespasian that has his face on one side and on the opposite side has a woman who's labeled as Rome, Roma. And it shows her seated on seven hills, yeah, which look yeah. more like seven mountains in the in the image. Uh, so uh, that there there are absolutely very clear connections to describing this as Rome, who who is in the time a great persecutor of Christians. Uh, if if you want to, if if for people in that time you want to sum up in a single image all the challenges they're facing with the world, uh, Rome is it. Because yeah. it's persecution, it's it's all the pagan sacrifice, pagan festivals, um, pagan morality uh, that they that Christians are dealing with, um, and so that that image just totally encapsulates it for for John's audience at the time. Yeah, and again, I think we can we can learn if we compare this with Isaiah, right? Rome is for John and his people what Assyria and then Babylon. Yeah. was for Isaiah and his people. Yeah. So they are the literal, real physical danger and cause of all sorts of emotional and whatever else persecutions. Yeah. Um, and yet they then become symbols yes. of worldliness 
in general. Uh, yeah. and, and in fact, John will sometimes use Babylon and sometimes Rome, right? And, and, and so will other apostles. Um, yeah. So uh, this is, I, I think, really appropriate for us to understand. And, and again, we have this, uh, I, this I, if we were to go to the seven churches I, and you look at what John is talking about them, I think more often than anything else, he's trying to tell them you're mixing the things of God with the things of the world. And this is a problem. And I, I think that's exactly what we see throughout the entire book of Revelation. And it's actually what I think Isaiah is talking about more than just about anything else as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's very appropriate for us today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's that's all I had to say about these chapters. Um, do you want to wrap it up by by talking a little about one of the major themes that goes that runs through all of this? Yeah, and, and what I think is is the real and full emphasis of uh, of the book of Revelation. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go back to the beginning then. Uh, so as these as these uh, seven seals are being opened, we get to that that climatic sixth seal where things slow down a bit, and in ch- uh, Revelation chapter six, that's where we're at. Uh, Revelation chapter six, verse fifteen. We see these kings of the earth, these great men, these rich men, and chief captains, and mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. And now in verse 16, they said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. And this is the part that I find interesting. They they finish this statement in verse 17 by saying, for that great day of wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And I think the entirety of the book of Revelation, while showing us all of these catastrophes that are happening, all these trials and tribulations, the entire thing is set up to answer that one question that's yeah. put in the mouths of these people who are terrified. The answer is they are asking it with the with the assumption that the answer is nobody. That the answer is, of course, nobody's going to be able to stand. But that's not the answer that the book of Revelation gives. We learn. And in fact, I have to say that this immediately makes me think back to the Revelation of the Seven Churches that we talked about last week, right? Oh. With who, those who can overcome and and be pillars in yes. God, or I mean, stand in the presence of God is basically yes. what it's are. That's That's been the theme from the beginning is that there yeah. are some who will overcome who will and overcome. be able to stand uh, yeah. there in the throne room. So yeah. sorry, keep going. And so, so the answer is given to us immediately in the next chapter. In chapter 7, that's where we meet the 12,000 who are called out of each of the 12 tribes, representing the, the, the full number, the 144,000, who are God's covenant people, who are the people uh, of Israel. But then that's not the only time we get an answer. We are reminded of it periodically again and again throughout Revelation. So jumping ahead to Revelation 12. Um, Revelation 12, verse 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Jumping down to the next verse, uh, and those, those who are with Christ, they overcame by the blood of the lamb, by mm-hmm. the word of their testimony. Uh, skipping down to verse 17, uh, talking about the, the remnant of the woman's seed. Uh, which keep the commandments, they're described as those who keep the commandments of God and have a testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, Skipping down to chapter 14 now, we get another reminder. Uh, And I looked, this is John speaking, and I looked, and lo, the Lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him— Wait, what verse are you in, sorry? uh, Oh, verse 1. This is the very first verse, 14 verse 1. Yeah, so uh, John sees the Lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him, there's the 144,000 again— having his father's name written on their foreheads, uh, which to me immediately makes me think of uh, the high priest mitre. It says, yeah. holiness to the Lord, right? The, right? the name of God written on the forehead. And and John is definitely about creating a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. John John's yeah. is describing this, this covenant people here. Which I think, again, was a very strong theme in last week's readings in the, the message yes. to the seven churches. Very, very strong theme in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the temple imagery and each of the blessings promised to the churches. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful connections there. Uh, verse 14, verse 3. Again, 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Uh, the next verse, um, verse 4. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. 
Uh, so the, the answer is given time and again in the book of Revelation, that, that those who will be able, able to stand are, as in verse 4, those which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And to be fair, that's not always easy to do. No. Because one of the places the Lamb goeth, as we've learned in the book of Revelation and other scripture, is through trials and tribulation yeah. uh, and, and ultimately death on the cross. And in fact, in the last couple of epistles we've been reading right before we got to Revelation, there was a lot of talking about that, right? You take joy in suffering with Christ and like Christ and in the tribulation yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah. And and I don't want to spoil too much for next next episode, but uh, I mean, where it's going is you will see those people, those 144,000 who were once embedded in this city called Babylon, where they faced all kinds of trials and tribulations, finally inheriting a new Jerusalem as part of yeah. a new heaven and new earth. They are the ones who welcome, who who are the bride of Christ, who welcome welcomes the lamb when he comes. And so beautiful promises are awaiting in, in the finale that's, that is to come. But right now we're at three and a half. Right now, yes. this part of the book of Revelation, we're... We're at those 1,260 days. We're in the thick of things, and and this is this is the time of trial. Yeah. But it's it's so nice that John reminds us, even in these time of times of trial, that there are those who will be able to stand. Um, that again, as you said, that doesn't mean that they avoid all difficulty, but they are able to make it through that difficulty because they're willing to follow the Lamb whithersoever He goes. Uh, that's, that's beautiful, a, a beautiful ending and wrap up. And as I think of it, I think president Nelson would uh, really want us to, to suggest we, you know, we talked about the, those who are standing, it's the 144,000 or those who are the, the church, which we've equated with the all of them we've uh, equated with, uh, keeping the covenant. Right. And, and which is also to follow Christ whithersoever he goes. If you're, uh, if you follow Christ, you're a disciple of Christ. Right. So it makes me yeah. think of those. Uh, three identifiers that he's given us, a child of God, child of the covenant, and a disciple of Christ. Um, those are all present in here. And and uh, it seems to me he's saying, uh, President Nelson would have us say, make and keep covenants with God, develop that relationship with God and his son, Jesus Christ, make and keep those covenants. And uh, and that will allow us to stand, as you said, as long as we follow him whithersoever he goes. And, and President Nelson has also said a number of times, if you're keeping the covenants, expect challenges. Don't expect it to be easy. It's just easier than than everything else, right? You will get to the rest, but it's after the climb. Uh, so, uh, I I think President Nelson would be thrilled with the message you've just given us. So, so thank you for that. And and uh, I I almost hated to say any of that after you had that beautiful uh, ending of just saying that that we will stand uh, if we follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. So, uh, I wanted to end on that message you gave us. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is wonderful stuff, and and uh, it's encouraging during times of trial uh, that we have this Christ can save us as we're in a covenant relationship with him. So we'll encourage everyone to hear more about that next week uh, when Nick Frederick is with us, who was with us just a, a while ago. And uh, Jason has given you a number of teasers to to get ready for Nick's message, and it's a uh, uh, we've already recorded. It's a wonderful episode, and it's it's great stuff. You're you're going to love it. Uh, so we'd encourage you to. Uh, not only share uh, what you've learned today, and I, 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 I've been edified by listening to Jason and things that I've studied this a lot, and uh, I learned things from Jason I didn't know before, so I'm sure that happened for you. So we hope you'll share that with others. Like, subscribe, follow, review, rate, uh, tell your friends, uh, tell them on Facebook and on the phone or whatever else you do so that more people can learn from Jason, and then tell them that next week is going to be great with Nick as well. So Thank you, Jason, and thank you I'll to our tell audience. Tell them to go get a copy of Ancient Christians, too. That's right. That's exactly right. So, yep. Uh, and and uh, we're just grateful for our audience as well. But mostly we're grateful for uh, our Father who sent that Lamb, uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, made it so we could be in that covenant relationship with them so that we can stand and return to be with Him again.